So, um, yeah, as Vittorio mentioned, I've been working now for 20, 25 years in science and I worked on the innate immune system of plants for many years on plant pathogenic interactions. But about eight or nine years ago, I experienced my midlife crisis. And, uh, uh, and, and the consequence of the midlife crisis was um, that I started this new uh, project, you know, really from scratch on the plant microbiota. Um, and what I will do uh, today is what, you know, the outcome of this midlife crisis. Um, and, and really what I try is discuss and share and hopefully also entertain you with our ongoing work on the plant microbiota assembly and functions in plant growth and health. And because I cannot expect that any of you knows what the microbiota, plant microbiota is about, I think I, I will spend a few introductory slides, a few introductory words to familiarize you uh, uh, with this topic. Now, um, it started off with the observation, you know, about 10 years ago, 15 years ago, that uh, any healthy asymptomatic plant out there in nature, you know, that you see now beautifully green, that these healthy asymptomatic plants live in association with a rich diversity of microorganisms. And here's just a little bit of nomenclature. The sum of the microbial cells that populate a healthy asymptomatic plant, that is what is called the plant microbiota. So the sum of the microbial cells. The sum of the microbial genomes that colonize a healthy, that's called the plant microbiome. Right? So that's important to keep in mind. Now, what this cartoon um, is aimed to illustrate, that one unique feature of the plant microbiota is that we are not only talking about microbes from one microbial class that colonize um, different organs of the plant. So for example, here leaf, these are bacteria. But in plants, we also have other classes of microorganisms. For example, these motile protists, protists uh, that actually graze on these bacteria. And in plants, we have many fungi that can either colonize underground parts like the root system or um, uh, the leaf system. So the plant microbiota consists of at least three microbial classes, bacteria, very dominant, fungi, um, and protists. Now, um, I'd like to, in one slide, more or less summarize almost you know, a decade of work on the plant microbiota, and I will focus on the root microbiota. So these are microorganisms that associate with healthy asymptomatic roots of plants, any plant out there. And to introduce into this, I'd just like to uh, illustrate with this slide that from a physiological point of view, a plant root is related to the digestive tract of vertebrates and humans. And you may ask why? because both of these organs, the digestive tract as well as the root, are organs that are dedicated for nutrient mobilization and nutrient uptake, right? So that's the shared feature amongst the two. And actually, the root has been described as a digestive organ where the inside is turned out. And that is actually illustrated in this cross-section here. So if you look at now this extended cross-section, you have a root. This is the outside of the root. This is the outermost uh, epithelium or um, the root epidermis. And this is the bulk soil. So all plants grow in natural soil, um, in unplanted soil. And if you now look at bacterial diversity and bacterial density, you see a very high density and diversity of bacteria in natural soil. And you see a progressive decline of diversity as you move closer to the, to the root. And you see an inverse topology in our gut, where inside the lumen of the gut, you have a very high bacterial density and diversity, and this progressively declines as you move closer to our gut epithelium, right? So it's, it's really, you know, the root can be perceived as a gut, you know, where the inside is, is, is turned out. And I should mention that really soil natural soil out there is in many cases being perceived as something boring, but actually soil is the compartment on this planet 
that harvest the greatest diversity, the greatest density of bacteria. So roughly one gram of soil, of natural soil, contains 10 to the 9 bacteria per gram of soil, right? So it's, soil is a bacterial broth, that, that's what it is. And roots actually uh, that are growing inside, inside natural soil, they are exposed to an incredible diversity of soil-borne bacteria. Okay, so one advantage that we have in plants over those that study the gut microbiome is that we know where the bacteria come from and we know the start inoculum. So each time a new root is formed, the, the bacteria that then end up associated with the roots and that live partly inside the roots, the root endospire, they are derived from the soil biome. That's very important, right? Very important. This is the known uh, start inoculum. For the gut, for, for example, for our human gut bacterium, this, the inoculum source, where do they come from, is most likely from the mother. But, you know, it's still a contentious issue, right? You know, wh whether there's really a defined start inoculum. Now, I mentioned before several microbial classes of the plant microbiota, bacteria, fungi, and protists. And what are the proposed functions of these microbial communities that associate with healthy plants? Nutrient mobilization from soil is a very important one. Uh, and you can see this, you know, I think this is a, a very important observation um, um, or fact. Plants are photosynthetic, they are photoautotrophic <coughs> organisms, and they can convert carbon dioxide into organic sugar, right, into organic carbon into carbohydrates, and they release a substantial amount of the fixed carbon dioxide via long distance transport into soil. So there's an enormous amount of organic carbon that is fixed via photosynthesis that is exuded into plant soil as a substantial energy investment into soil. You ask, why is that? And keep in mind that a plant is never short of organic carbon, but we as animals or humans, of course, we need to take up organic nutrients all the time, right? That, so that's a, a very fundamental difference. We need to take up organic nutrients, but plants produce their own organic carbon. And so when we compared in this study, you know, two years ago, the microbial community of the gut and the microbial community of the roots, what we learned from this exercise is that there's essentially zero overlap of OTU. So the bacteria that populate your digestive tract and the bacteria that populate the root, there's zero OTU overlap, you know, in terms of bacterial species. So if you eat your vegetables later on during lunch, don't worry, none of these plant-associated microbes will persist in your digestive tract, okay? That's important. So one function of the root microbiota I mentioned is nutrient mobilization from soil. Another one is very important for plant health is indirect pathogen protection. I will show you an example. Abiotic stress tolerance, soil tolerance, drought tolerance, um, and increased plant fitness. So there's an incre increased reproductive um, uh, fitness of plants in the presence of these plant-associated microbes. Um, another important observation published a few years ago, it's a rapid acquisition of microbes from the soil biome within a few days after seed germination. If you put a seed in the soil, within 10 days, you have a mature, fully differentiated root microbiota. So it's a rapid process. And uh, there's a conserved taxonomic composition. I will show you that. At phylum level, so high taxonomic rank in contrasting environments on every plant individual. Every plant individual has the same taxonomic, very robust trait. But this applies only for bacteria, not for fungi. So the bacterial microbiota must be considered different from the fungi, from all the fungi that live in association. But conserved taxonomic composition, we always find the same, the same suspects, if you like. Next one, it's an evolutionary ancient plant trait that might have its evolutionary origin before the emergence of seed plants, so maybe even in lycopods or even in microalgae that live in soil. And um, the, the root microbiome, as, as well as the leaf microbiome, they're, they're remarkably stable communities, microbial communities. They're stable against metabolic perturbations, for example, caused by flowering when plants flower, or drastic changes in plant stature. 
Um, and finally, if we look at variation of the communities, if we quantify how different are they, the percent of variation that matters most is soil type. It explains 20 to 25 percent because soil is the diet type of of plants, right? If you grow them in an acidic soil, in an alkaline soil, in a marginal soil, nutrient rich, nutrient poor soil, very much as our gut microbiota depends on the diet type, um, the, the root microbiota is very much dependent on soil type. <coughs> plant species and genotype explains five to 10% of the variation and then a little bit plant age and soil residence time. All right, now, uh, a few years ago, uh, my group and also Julia Fogel's group, um, we joined our forces and we wanted to move plant microbiota research beyond what I showed in the previous slide, just descriptive studies. We wanted to generate the tools and a toolbox that enabled us to really carry out experiments that can dissect causal relationships between the plant microbiota for plant health. And so what we decided to do is we uh, systematically have established culture collections, culture collections from Arabidopsis plants grown in nature, right, grown in natural soil, and we've established a root-derived culture collection of the bacterial microbiota <coughs> from root and, in parallel, from leaves, so bacteria that populate leaves. And what is shown on these complex slides is that we've been able to isolate as pure cultures 66% of the root-associated bacteria and 61% of the leaf-associated bacteria. And what is shown in this slide is in the inner circle, these dots, they present the result of a culture-independent community profiling technology that enables you essentially to detect all in a simple form bacterial species that associate with roots when they grow in natural soil. So this is the diversity that we can detect using culture-independent technologies. And what you see is the phylogenetic tree in the center, and I've color-coded this. In green, we have alpha, beta, and gamma protobacteria. In red, we have the actinobacteria and then in blue, the bacteriodetes, and then we have the firmicutes. And you can see at a glance that the taxonomic composition in the leaf is very similar, right? Most of them are alpha, beta, gamma, protobacteria, actinobacteria, bacteriodetes, and some firmicutes. And so from thousands of isolated bacteria, we've then established a core collection of the root and the leaf microbiota that is maximized for um, phylogenetic diversity and that now comprises the majority of the bacterial species that colonize Arabidopsis roots and leaves in nature. And um, when you look very closely you can see there's an extensive species overlap between the, reef, the, the root and the leaf microbiota. And so the take-home message from this slide is that the majority of bacterial species of the leaf and root microbiota is culturable, we can store them at minus 80 degrees, and now we have a representative collection of both the leaf and the root microbiota. And what I want to now demonstrate to you is how we capitalize on these culture collections to carry out microbiota reconstitution biology under laboratory environments, so where we mimic these root and leaf associated communities in the lab. And I need to introduce um, uh, for this to you calcined clay, which is an inert matrix. It's simple, it's simplified soil, if you like, because you can, you know, this is clay. I'm sure many of you know that you can grow also plants, um, you know, in, 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 in clay. Uh, you can simply autoclave this, the, the clay so that it's germ free. And then you place on top of the clay, you place seed surface sterilized Arabidopsis thaliana seeds of this model plant, right? You put surface, so you have essentially a gnotobiotic plant, very similar to gnotobiotic mice. The only difference is that this is hundredfold less expensive than doing an experiment with gnotobiotic mice. And then we grow these germ-free plants in these transparent, closed environments. These are simple magenta boxes, and we grow them these, and they grow nicely, you know, in the absence of any of any microbes. And of course, now we use this gnotobiotic or germ-free system to add 
our individually cultured bacteria from the microbiota, root and leaf. And for example, the leaf-derived bacteria, we can spray inoculate them on three-week-old plants. And we call these defined microbial communities from our culture collection synthetic communities, or in short, syncoms. We add them, then we close the container, we co-culture the plant with the, with the bacterial community for about four weeks, and then we compare the input community and the output community, and we use this by culture independent community uh, uh, profiling again. And this is a very popular technique. It's called 16S RNA gene community. Probably super simple. You just use um, PCR primers that amplify uh, segments of the bacterial 16S RNA gene. Then you subject it to sequencing, and then you define, uh, you, you cluster your sequences according to um, um, a sequence identity or sequence dissimilarity. So I show you a typical result of such a microbiota, leaf microbiota reconstitution experiment, and I need to guide you through this experiment. What we did here, we reconstituted on these germ-free plants, we um, um, uh, added a 226-member synthetic community right, from leaves, spray inoculated, um, and then co-incubated it for four weeks. This is how we display the results, is as a heat map. Each column represents a biological replicate, and each line either represents a single strain from these 226 members, or a group of strains if their 16S sequence is essentially identical. And then the color code that you see indicates the relative abundance of an individual community member from these 226 in the community. Right? And so I hope you agree with me, this is our input synthetic community that we spray on the plants. And we do this, we culture the bacteria, the 226 bacteria separately in 96 microtiter plates. To, um, um, we grow them to stationary phase and then we mix them in a one-to-one -one ratio. So that's why you see a relatively um, equal input. And this is after four weeks of incubation on the leaf. And you see a very clear community shift, right? The pattern changes. And now we did a very important thing. So what is shown here in the color is the phylogenetic affiliation. And I mentioned to you in my introductory slide that the taxonomic structure at high taxonomic rank, at phylum rank, is very robust. We always see protobacteria in natural communities when plants grow in nature. They are the most abundant ones, then actinobacteria, then bacteroidetes and firmicutes. And this is what is called a rank abundance plot. Now, when we do this with our synthetic community, the 226 member from the culture collection, and uh, which is shown in dark green, now you can see there's a striking similar community structure between the community that we've reconstituted in the lab with the communities that we see in natural leaves um, uh, with plants grown in the field. And I think that ability to really reconstitute a community, a bacterial community on the leaf that mimics exactly the same community structure as seen in leaf, I think that justifies why we can do microbiota reconstitution experiments in the leaf and uh, in the root as well, it justifies any you know, microbiota reconstitution experiments in the lab. And it's indicative there must be some autoregulatory mechanisms that contribute to the establishment of these communities on the leaves that are very similar in the field. It's a very robust structure. Now, there was one unexpected observation. Recall, this community we spray inoculated on leaves. Now, then four weeks of incubation, and this is what we saw on the leaves, but we also looked at the roots, right? So this is, you know, in the clay. When we harvested the clay unexpectedly, we also noted that some of the leaf-associated bacteria ectopically colonize Arabidopsis roots. So somehow, from the leaf, they make it down to the root. That was rather unexpected. And of course, we've done the reciprocal experiments. We've added our synthetic community of root-derived bacteria to the root, and then we can see that a part of them actually moves by upward migration to the leaf. So what these laboratory experiments with these synthetic communities have revealed is an unexpected leaf and root microbiota dynamics. Part of the leaf associated bacteria move down, and part of the root associated bacteria by upward migration can make it um, uh, to the leaf. So that's, I think, the first take home message. 
Now, I mentioned to you that really a distinctive feature different from our gut microbiota is that plants do not only live in association with bacteria, they do not only have a bacterial root microbiota, but they, they live in association with many fungi. These are called fungal endophytes. And what this slide shows is this beautiful biodiversity of root-associated fungal endophytes that colonize Arabidopsis plants grown in natural soil, and actually the same soil type from which we establish the bacterial culture collection. So these are all these root-derived fungal endophytes. And um, Paloma Duran, a PhD student, and Stefan Hakar, uh, who's just started now his own group, they have established in much the same way by combining culture-independent and culture-dependent um, uh, methods, they've established a culture collection of root-associated fungal endophytes of Arabidopsis. And these are mainly Basidiomycota or Ascomycota members. And this shows the, in the outer ring, this, this is the phylogenetic tree, and in the outer ring, this shows the relative abundance in different environments, in different soil types. And you can see that in each soil type, there are only few fungal endophytes that are abundant. Most others are low abundant ones. And the good news is that 32 of the 36 most abundant fungal endophytes they have been able to culture, okay? So now, recapitulate this. We have a bacterial culture collection and we have a fungal endophyte culture collection. Now we can do the next step and we can really go for complex microbiota reconstitution experiments in the lab. So again, um, for this purpose, I need to introduce to you to a second germ-free system that we use in addition to the calcine clay system. This is the so-called flow pot system where we sterilize the soil, so we kill all the microbes in the soil, right? And then we place, again, these surface sterilized Arabidopsis seeds on the top of the sterilized soil, and then we repopulate the soil with our bacterial communities or the fungal communities or combinations thereof, and then we monitor plant growth. And that result I want to illustrate to you, generated by Paloma, and what is shown in this bar graph here is the fresh weight. So it's just the above ground part of these, um, um, the, the biomass, if you like, of these plants. And in this case, these are germ-free plants after six weeks. So no microbes, totally germ-free, germ-free conditions. The plants grow nicely. Now when we add all our root-derived bacteria, a total of 177, the plants grow slightly better, but it's statistic there's a trend, but it's statistically not yet significant. But look at this one now. When we add 34 of our root-associated fungal endophytes, or these are all mycetes, all mycetes, they look like fungi, but they are totally different thing. You know, they are, they are um, yeah, in a different uh, kingdom. Um, and when we add those now, root-derived ones, essentially all plants die. So this, is very, this was a very striking observation. So now you add the fungi only, the plants are dead. Now, when you reconstitute the bacterial community plus the all mycetes or bacterial community plus the fungi, then you see rescue of growth. And if you reconstitute the full monty, if you like, bacteria plus fungi plus all mycetes, then the growth of the plant is significantly better than the germ-free plants. So this, I think, allows us to draw a very important conclusion, and that is the bacterial root microbiota is very important because it protects Arabidopsis against root-associated fungi and all mycetes. Both the bacteria and the fungi compete in the soil for the organic carbon, you know, released via photosynthesis from roots, and the bacteria root microbiota really Fungi are competitors of the bacteria in soil. And I think that could explain this really striking results that the bacterial microbiota is necessary to protect plants um, against soil-borne fungi, and including many pathogenic fungi. All right, now I'd like to uh, change gears and tell you um, um, both you know, about published work um, last year, as well as then really spending time on unpublished. And so this slide is aimed to illustrate and introduce to you <coughs> legumes. Legumes are one of the oldest domesticated plants on this planet. You know, I'm sure many of you will enjoy those, uh, uh, this food. And they were independently domesticated 
from wild relatives by humans in Middle America by the Aztecs, as well as in the Middle East. So there are records even you know, from ancient uh, Egypt. And uh, legumes are very important, uh, not only for food, but for agriculture. You know, they are used here as intercropping. They're grown next to um, uh, corn. They're also used in crop rotation. And, but they are best known, perhaps even some of the students may know, that legumes have one unique ability. Legumes have the capacity to engage in a symbiotic interaction with a soil-borne bacterium <coughs> called rhizobium. And these rhizobia can trigger, in the roots of these um, legumes, they can trigger a de novo organogenesis. These are root nodules. They massively amplify inside the roots. And inside the roots, they generate an essentially anoxic environment. And then they can fix atmospheric nitrogen, convert it into ammonium. And in nutrient poor conditions, in nitrogen, uh, in, in low nitrogen soils, then this ammonium is absolutely important for plant growth, right? And this is why, particularly in South America, um, where you have many marginal soils, so uh, low nitrogen and, and low nutrient soils, um, uh, legumes are, are, are very important in, in agriculture because it helps plants uh, to grow uh, in nitrogen poor soils, okay? Now, the question that we asked for our work are host genes that are required for this very complex developmental process of nodulation, are they also necessary for the establishment of the bacterial microbiota? And we capitalized, we teamed up um, with our colleagues from Denmark uh, who have actually uh, worked for more, more than two decades on a model legume called Lotus japonicus and its association with a symbiont called Mesorhizobium loti. And they have identified many mutants in the host, lotus, that completely abolish this very complex process of um, nodulation and, and symbiosis. This is the signaling pathway. These are parallel signaling pathway. And we decided to use for our experiments mutants in three of these genetically defined components. The NFR5 receptor <coughs> mutant, that is necessary to perceive a bacterial signal that initiates the, this complex nodulation. Then a mutant in a transcription factor called NIN2 that acts in these parallel pathways. And then a cytokinin receptor mutant, LHK. And what is common amongst these mutants is in all of the cases, the symbiosis is impaired. And we decided to grow the wild type plants and the mutants in natural soil, the same soil from which we established our culture collection. What we noted is that these nodulation mutants that, can, that fail to undergo to establish um, um, uh, nodulation, as does uh, the wild type plants, that, they, that their growth is reduced compared to wild type plants. But otherwise, they look completely healthy, right? So there's no disease symptoms. They, just the performance, you know, the, the, the growth is, is, is reduced. And so then we decided, and this is work from Rafael Sgajai and from Ruben, we decided to apply our computational pipeline, our experimental pipeline, to determine root-associated bacterial communities in these lotus plants grown in natural soil using this very popular methods of microbial ecology, so amplifying the 16S RNA gene of bacteria and then sequencing uh, those amplicons. And this is the result of a community profiling experiment where uh, from through, essentially from four compartments, bacteria that we detect in four compartments, the unplanted soil, the rhizosphere, the rhizosphere is the soil surrounding directly the root, physically touching the root, and then we have the root of wild type Lotus japonicus without the nodules, and then we have the nodules. And I hope you agree with me, this is a principal component analysis, that the bacterial communities that we detect in unplanted soil, in rhizosphere, root without nodule, and in the nodule are clearly distinctive. So we see separate bacterial communities in these compartments. Now what we did, and this gets a little complex, now we compared this very elaborate root microbiota structure of lotus wild type plants with the nodulation mutants that I mentioned to you before. 
And I simplified this slide. This is, again, a principal component analysis. These, this is the community in unplanted soil. Now, this is the root community of wild type and the rhizosphere community of wild type. And these are the communities that we detect in roots and the rhizosphere of the nodulation mutants. It clearly shifted, right? So, and it explains almost 10% of the variation. It's a substantial community shift. So what this tells you is that genes that are necessary in the host to establish a binary symbiosis with this nitrogen-fixing um, bacteria are also required for the proper organization of the root microbiota. And this community shift is remarkably complex, and that is illustrated here where we now look in the wild type roots at the bacterial order, so the taxonomic groups of bacteria that are enriched in roots. And you find, of course, rhizobia enriched, the bocalderialis, and you know, acidomicrobida. These are all bacteria that become enriched in the lotus wild type roots. If you compare to the mutant roots, you can see that there are several bacterial orders, the rhizobialis, undetectable. Here, the bocalderialis, almost completely depleted in the root. Uh, the, um, I think where the myxococcalis, it's the same. So in total, this enabling genetically the nodulation pathway depletes the root compartment of more than 10 bacterial orders. So it's really a very complex depletion of multiple bacterial orders. And I don't want to go into details because this is published work. We could show that the root-associated community shift in those mutants is a direct consequence of the non-functional nodulation pathway. And the way how we interpret this is that this symbiosis pathway is essential for the assembly of a root-associated bacterial networks in which the rhizobia, the nitrogen-fixing rhizobia, are just one hub you know, of a microbial network that acts together for maximum plant productivity under nitrogen-limiting conditions. Right? That's, that's the major takeaway. <coughs> now, Normally, here the story ends, but um, what we learned when we extended these experiments, um, our community profiling, not only with the legume, lotus root, rhizosphere, and we see inside lotus nodules, there's a very specific, very high enrichment of rhizobia, but what we noted that in non-legumes, so plants that do not engage in nitrogen fixation, we also see an enrichment of rhizobia substantially over unplanted soil. So it's not, not really restricted uh, to, to legume plants. And, um, uh, uh, and I think this is supported by a recent publication that there's a conserved rhizobia microbiota membership in all flowering plants, not only in legumes. Right? And um, when we looked at the communities really of these non-legumes, so for example in barley root or in Arabidopsis root, um, and then we see that there are overlapping taxonomic profiles of these rhizobia in the root rhizosphere and the soil compartment. Only in the nodules and in the leaf we see a distinctive community. So that is, and, and that motivated us then to dig deeper into this core lineage of the root microbiota, these rhizobia, that we see in all plant species, in all soils, and that become enriched in the roots, not only in legumes, but also in non-legumes. And we did this together. I'm closely affiliated with a startup company, Agbiome in the US, actually I co-founded that, that company. And we've then isolated now, this is what I will call a botanical garden microbiota um, analysis, where we identified and isolated 940 new rhizobial exemplars from very different plants including oats, cucumber, maple, wheat, cotton, and so on, so non-legume plants. And together, we've isolated now 1,300 rhizobia from the roots of different plant species grown in different soils in the U.S., all over the U.S., right? So very, very deep culture collection, and we subjected all of them to whole genome sequencing. And the result of this whole genome sequencing for these 1,300 root-derived rhizobia both from legumes and non-legumes, is shown here as a phylogenetic tree. And this is just to illustrate, look, our original culture collection was based on 202 strains from the root drive from Arabidopsis, right? This was diversified for taxonomy. But now we've increased the resolution you know, from, I think, about 20 members to 1,300. And now we have whole genome sequences of them. And then what we could show is that, indeed, in these non-legume plants, we see association and enrichment of all the 
sublineages of rhizobia, cyanorhizobium, bradyrhizobium, agrobacterium, mesorhizobium, and so on. And we identified even new sublineages like, like these here. So that was, I think, a very uh, worthwhile um, exercise. And we have now really representatives of all known and potential novel sublineages of the rhizobialis. I want to give you one important feature. I hope this is, yes, I think I still have some time, of, um, of uh, these rhizobialis genomes. So this is a plot of the number of gene families in these 1,300 genomes as, the, as a function of the number of genomes. And these are CAG annotated gene families, so bacterial genes with known gene function. And you can see roughly at 500, 600, or 700 genomes, this curve plateaus off. So we've reached saturation. And that is what is called in bacterial microbiology the core genome. So the core genome of the rhizobialis, we've saturated this with our 1,300 cultures, is around, you know, it's less than 5,000 bacterial families. But keep in mind, these are Kyoto Encyclopedia annotated genes. These are known genes. Now, if you do a de novo gene clustering of all these 1,300 genomes, including unknown ones, right, this is computationally extraordinary. Um, uh, intensive, we could only do it for 500 uh, genomes because every new genome we add, the computational time grows exponentially. So if we wanted to do it with 1,300, even really with high, with high, high power computing, this would take um, uh, too long. But what we've seen, look, this is now 500 genomes. Now this is the, the CAG annotated gene family and all the genes of unknown gene functions, so it's all gene families. And you can see this is still increasing, right? And I bet it will continue to increase. And look at this, even with 500, gene, um, uh, with 500 genomes of these rhizobia, we have 75,000 gene families. And what this indicates, this is a typical feature of bacterial genomes, you know, for, I, I predict for almost every bacterial taxonomic lineage. And this depicts this extraordinary natural genetic diversity of the pan genome. There's an open genome. So the number of gene families is greater than one, and this is what's called the pan genome. And the pan genome, even with 1,300 bacteria, right, we're far away from saturation. So that explains how many diversity of functions there's out there in the root associated rhizobia, right? Okay, I think that's important. Now, recall, I mentioned that in legumes, the nitrogen fixing rhizobia that fix nitrogen, you know, to supply nitrogen ammonium to the plants, they are found only in uh, these nodules of, of legumes. And they require a bacterial gene, the nitrogenase. It's actually a cluster of genes. This is the NIFH gene. And they require nodulation genes. And so all of these bacteria that I've color coded now in green. These are rhizobia that were isolated from nodules of legume plants. And we've now superimposed all the new 900 rhizobia that we've isolated from non-nodulating plants. And now you can see that for each NIF H plus or nitrogen fixing sublineage of the rhizobialis order, we have a complementary set in the non-legumes, right? And if you look at the at the topology of this phylogenetic tree, I think this strongly suggests that the capacity for nitrogen fixation and nodulation was acquired multiple independent times in each rhizobial sublineage. Right? So essentially, all rhizobia, all these sublineages can colonize any plant root of any plant species, but only in the legumes there was via horizontal gene transfer, the acquisition of this nitrogen fixing gene and of the nodulin genes, and that then resulted in an extreme form of symbiosis. Right? So we see you know, in all plant species enrichment in the root of these rhizobia, but in the legumes, a very specialized form of evolution. And I think for the interest of time, I skip this, um, but I would like to address now for the final five minutes um, a very important question. You could say, well, now we have all these rhizobia, you know, in non-legume plants. Does it matter? You know, are they just sitting there, or do they have any activity? Now, this is work from um, Thomas Nakano, and um, where he measured, you know, he, now he was growing his germ-free Arabidopsis plants on an agar plate. And then we add 
individual strains of these microbia, of these rhizobia that I mentioned to you from the Arabidopsis root microbiota, right? So these, these guys here. And very important, we were guided now by this deep, deep culture collection of the rhizobia. So we used representatives of each sublineage that we tested now for their activity on the plants. And we measured, he measured here, primary root lengths, so the lengths of, of Arabidopsis roots. And I hope you agree with me, when he tested individual Rhizobialis exemplars, these are controls, these are germ-free, lengths of germ-free roots, these are heat-killed bacteria, and these are, when he tested the different exemplars that correspond to the different lineages, most of the Rhizobia, they promote root growth if you add them. Few don't, for example, these three here, they don't, this even inhibits growth, but those bacteria that have no growth promoting activity, they cannot efficiently colonize Arabidopsis root under these conditions. And importantly, we used as control in these experiments other members of the core root microbiota. These are Sphingomonadalis and Caulobacterialis. They are just like Rhizobia alpha proteobacteria, so the same taxonomic class, right? But as you can see, none of them is capable to promote root growth, but they still colonize Arabidopsis roots. So that tells you the capacity for root growth promotion in non-legumes is a shared or characteristic trait of the rhizobialis. Right? So this illustrates how we utilize systematic culture collection, whole genome sequence information, phylogenetic information, not just to test one bug, you know, but systematically a characteristic trait of an entire um, uh, taxonomic lineage. And this is more for details, but I, you know, I, I don't show you the original data. We can test how do the bacteria do that. And we could, and there are two very important plant hormones, um, uh, cytokinin and uh, auxin, and using Arabidopsis mutants that are impaired in the perception or signaling of cytokinin signaling, or mutants that are impaired in the perception of the phytohormone to uh, auxin, auxin transport or auxin signaling, we could show that this root growth promotion is independent, is really independent of the known antagonism of these two plant hormones that in Arabidopsis is known to control root lengths. And now there is a very interesting observation. Many of our gut microbiota actually have the capacity, there's some uh, good evidence and also from some uh, animals, even from, from more basal animals, that these root, that these microbiota members can interfere with stem cell homeostasis. Now, this is a plant root, and at the tip of the root are these so-called root meristem cells, and you can count them. And this is a germ-free one, and now here we have added, you know, our rhizobia members. Here we quantified the number of meristematic cells, and you can clearly see when you add these rhizobia, then the number of meristematic cells essentially doubles, right? So these microbiota members, they can interfere with root stem cell homeostasis. And in a way that it really increases the number of root meristem cells and then leads to um, a significant uh, growth of, of, of these Arabidopsis roots. And I skip this, this is, you know, a more detailed analysis where we looked at the neighboring cells. These are the so-called um, elongating cells and differentiated root cells, there's no significant difference. It's really very specific that these rhizobia interfere with the root uh, stem cell homeostasis. So a last, a last original data slide. Just as you re totally rely on an innate immune system, well, you also rely on an adaptive immune system um, that is required to really keep pathogens at bay. And plants have evolved very similar to animals, also an elaborate innate immune system that enables them to detect, to sense the presence of microbial epitopes and pathogen-derived molecules, and then they activate a powerful innate immune response that terminates the growth of pathogens. And so a few years ago, it was discovered that one of these immune receptors that detects the presence of an epitope <coughs> from a conserved bacterial-derived molecule called flagellin. And this is the so-called FLAG22 peptides. If you add it to germ-free Arabidopsis plants, just adding this peptide will, will activate a powerful immune response, but it will also result 
in cessation of Arabidopsis growth, right? So the, the plants stop to grow. And this is interpreted as a growth immunity trade-off. So a plant can either defend itself or it can grow, but at the same time, that's not possible, right? And so by the way, in humans, humans also detect bacterial flagellin via the TLR5 receptor, a surface receptor, and then there's an intracellular immune receptor called MIP5. And so this is sensing of bacterial, of this bacterial peptide on the leaf surface, and we could reproduce this early observation when we add to our germ-free um, Arabidopsis plants the flagellin peptide, we see reduced root growth. If we, um, these are non inoculant no, sorry, this is an immune receptor mutant, so this has a mutation in the FLS2 immune receptor, and the plant is blind, it cannot perceive FLAC22. And importantly, now in these conditions, where we add to the wild-type plant our rhizobium and FLAC22, now you can see that the rhizobia can override this root growth inhibition. So the plants can still grow, although they've activated an immune response. And I think what this suggests is that rhizobia microbiota members can interfere with a plant growth immunity trade-off independently of the perception of this not factor that they need to establish in legumes. So the take home message is that root microbiota members can dial into the innate immune system and they can essentially override this growth immunity trade off. They can still defend themselves, but they can also grow. That's remarkable in my view. All right, so conclusions Rhizobia and legumes induce nodule formation, fix atmospheric nitrogen in binary symbiotic relations with legumes. That's textbook knowledge. Bacterial species within the rhizobialis order define a core lineage of the plant microbiota in all flowering plants, suggesting alternative forms of interactions with plants, and the set of genes required for nodulation and nitrogen fixation in legume symbiosis was acquired multiple independent times, most likely by horizontal gene transfer in each rhizobialis sublineage, constitute a beautiful example of convergent evolution of symbiosis. The capacity for nodulation nitrogen fixation and was likely acquired from a predisposed root association. So what I'm saying is that the root microorder is just like a launch pad you know, for the evolution of highly sophisticated symbiotes or a launch pad for the evolution of nasty pathogens. And I think that's conceptually analogous to the gut microorder in humans. The majority of rhizobal root microorder members have a robust root growth promotion phenotype, which is characterized by an increase in root meristem cell size and that acts independently of the known antagonism of these two phytohormones, auxin and that normally control root growth. And last but not least, uh, these rhizobia can uh, interfere with the plant growth immunity trade-off, which is really a remarkable property you know, that we now need to understand molecularly. So at the very, very end, you know, I want to <laughs> zoom out and I want to illustrate to you that really plant microbiota research is not just about you know, understanding the molecular details, but one reason why plant microbiota captures imagination, fascination, is because um, there are what I call high-level traits in nature that are highly relevant to our food production and to agriculture. And all of these traits, I think, reflect um, what is called the plant soil feedback at the root soil interface. <coughs> Recall, you know, the start inoculum are the soil resident bacteria that associate with the roots. And there are really phenomena observed by farmers out there that really illustrate how valuable knowledge on the plant microbiota is. One um, phenomenon are, are so-called disease suppressive soils. It's a global phenomenon. You find them from Australia, from Italy, I think that there are several disease suppressive soils, Europe, US, everywhere. And the phenomenon is you can grow a susceptible variety, so you know, a, a, a crop that is highly vulnerable to a soil-borne disease. Right? And you can see this here, this is the, you know, the disease ones. But if you grow it in a disease suppressive soil, right, they're completely resistant to it. And I showed you the evidence before that the bacterial microbiota protects plants against soil-borne fungi, right? And so I think a very plausible <coughs> hypothesis is that in the disease-suppressive soil, there are some microbes that specifically enable the, the provide a protection against soil-borne pathogenic uh, fungi. Um, there's another uh, very widespread uh, practice, particularly here in Europe, 
It's called biofumigation. I don't know if you are aware of this, but you know, farmers try to improve something, very strange term, it's called soil health, right? And um, this was done in the Netherlands, for example. It was very popular um, to uh, a practice called um, soil clearing. And what this meant is you essentially add methyl bromide, which completely sterilizes the entire soil. Right? And that kills, of course, all of these soil-borne pathogens. Right? But this biofumigation, it's based on an empirical observation that it works best when you grow um, a particular phylogenetic lineage of plants. They are called brassica, so rapeseed oil. I'm sure many of you have seen this. And what happens is that in the rapeseed soil, the plants are really now just um, mulched into the soil. And these plants have evolved the capacity to produce a very specific class of compounds called glucosinolates. And these glucosinolates have potent antimicrobial activity. And it's thought that these, um, that these plant-derived components then have an impact on the soil microbiota. So that, I think, requires to be studied in detail. And now farmers, you know, farming is not science, right? It's just empirical observation. And there are hundreds of different culturally inherited practices. And I showed you before intercropping. You have a soybean next to a cornfield or crop rotation. You know, farmers typically don't grow the same crop in the same soil type. And I think this is all very likely related to plant soil feedback because the plants, you know, enrich for a certain type of, of bacteria. So I think that's a huge field for, um, for future research. And look, these are my country fellows, you know, from 100 years ago. Um, Fritz Haber and Karl Bosch, who invented uh, the Haber-Bosch process, right? And 50% of the ammonium in your body, right, is derived from synthetic fertilizers, 50% in your... It was invented in 1906, and the production of um, um, uh, synthetic fertilizers started, I think, in 90... What is it? You know, 50s or so. And if you look at the increase of the world population... It's as simple as that. The reason that we can feed the world 50% is because of this, Harbour Bosch. The rest is plant genetics, is because we can breed varieties that are high yielding. But as you know, synthetic fertilizers <coughs> have some trade off. You know, there's leaching of nitrate into underground. And so I think there is a need on the long run. Phosphate, which is part of synthetic fertilizer, is a limited resource. So I think there is a need to develop alternatives to synthetic fertilizers, and I'm sure the plant, the root-associated microbes are a rich source to identify microbes that can solubilize phosphate, can make nitrogen. I showed the rhizobia as an example. So that's why the industry, why there are now so many startup companies working on this field. And last not least, the very last, you know, this is we lack the, the whole field of plant microbiota, but also the human microbiota, it needs more theory and community evolvability. We now have a very nice theory on the evolution of individuals. We also have population genetics, you know, very advanced in bacterial microbiology, also in plant genetics. But how communities evolve, right? Taxonomically, we don't know that. So, you know, all what I want to say you know, this is, this is research for the next 50 years. I'm absolutely convinced. Okay, the most important slide is really to acknowledge the people who have contributed to this work in Cologne at the Max Planck. This is only a small subset of my root group, um, but those, you know, I think um, for which I've presented unpublished work, these are Ruben Garrido, a fantastic computer scientist, I should say, together with Roy Thomas Nocano, spearheading the work on the rhizobia, uh, um, both in Lotus as well as in Arabidopsis, together with Rafal, and a PhD student, Nina Dombrowski. She now works on marine microbiology in Texas in the U.S. Our colleague, you know, Simona Rodotoy, she really helped us to get into this Lotus work. And, of course, my colleagues at Eggbiome, the company that I also co-founded in the U.S., um, James Henriksen, Scott Eugnes, and Eric Ward. Um, so they helped us really in getting all of these rhizobium culture collections and a number of funding bodies, of course, Max Planck, EMBO, ERC, and so on. And thank you for your attention and your patience.